Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the fellowship series on the AOC PMNR podcast. I'm Chanel Davidoff, and I'll be your host for the show. If you're new to the podcast in this series of episodes, uh, we are going to be learning about all different various uh, PMNR fellowships. We chat with current fellows and early career attendings about their unique fellowship experiences. Uh, you can also expect some insight into their program and key tips on pursuing your dream fellowship. So today I'm really looking forward to introducing our guest. Um, it's Dr. Karthik Sabapathy. Uh, currently, he's a pain fellow at Penn State Hershey Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Sabapathy and I go way back. I'm excited mm -hmm. to have him on the show. I met him as a medical student rotating through and he's just been great. So thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. It's an interesting position to be in. As a <laughs> I know. A member of AOC PMNR and being a your senior <laughs> resident at one exactly. point. Exactly. It's so circle. great. <laughs> it's so great to see like where you've come and how far you've come. So, uh, let's start off with an introduction. Tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and what brought you into the field of PMNR. Sure. Uh, so my name is Karthik. Like you said, I grew up from Long Island, New York. Uh, went to study history at Tulane in New Orleans. Then I got my DO out in Pomona, California. And it was there that I kind of met my, actually one of my OMT teachers was a physiatrist. And so he introduced me to the field of physiatry. I was really into OMT at that point. He said, you know, maybe this is a specialty you might want to pursue. And the rest is kind of history from there. No pun intended with the history, right? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So that's so interesting. So you had a very different background coming into PMNR. Um, has that affected kind of um, your training in any way or uh, you doing medicine in general? Yeah, I don't know. I would like to think it makes me more well-rounded, but I guess that's uh, up to my patients and, <laughs> and attendings to decide. <laughs> uh, but I always figured, you know, I was going to get enough science eventually. So I wanted to also uh, study some things that interest me on the side and still minored in bio. So, you know, I did all the prereqs and everything, but, uh, but yeah, I think it, it was something I wanted to do for myself. That's great. That's great. Um, very different too. It's a very unique path. Um, so in general, what was residency like for you at Penn State? I know you went there, so. Oh man, it was uh, incredible. It was a blessing in disguise. Um, I, you know, I can say it now, it wasn't, uh, wasn't my top choice at the time, but, you know, it's one of those things in life where, you know, you get what you most need, I suppose. And I couldn't have imagined, uh, my life any other way now. I met an incredible class who you got to meet as well. Uh, three people I still consider best friends to this day. And probably, uh, even after this is all you know, we're done with Penn State and everything, but, um, but yeah, I met an incredible group of people. They embraced me. They, you know, I got to learn from a really great group of people. I've been through three departments at Penn State now, from internal medicine to PMNR to now the anesthesia department. Um, and all of them have been phenomenal. You know, I haven't met one really malignant professor. Everyone's willing to teach. Everyone's very down to earth. Um, the people are phenomenal. Cost of living's great. <laughs> I got a pain <laughs> Right, so. and you're in the sweetest place on earth, arguably, exactly. Hershey, Pennsylvania, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I can attest to that. Rotated through. I was just so amazed with it being a new program at the time and uh, starting out. I, I, I loved rotating there, and I actually went there for my intern year, too. So um, great, great times. Uh, so I know it was a new program. So how, how do you think that uh, affected your training in general? Was it like, what were the pros and cons of it? Yeah, um, I think it was definitely something um, you had to consider going into. And for anyone who's considering going to a newer program, uh, there's going to be inherent pros and cons. cons. Um, I think, you know, some of the pros are that, you know, you get to have bigger influence, I feel like, because a lot of established programs are already kind of set in their ways. Um, and they may be less receptive to resident feedback and changing things because, you know, it's worked for, I don't know, 50, 70 years, whatever they've been doing it for versus in our program, uh, we really only had a history. I think we were the you know, third graduating class. Um, so for us, it was a lot easier to, first of all, we had amazing access to a program director. They knew each and one of us. 
Uh, we got to sit down with them on a weekly basis. Every day we saw them, um, but they were very, very receptive to our feedback. Um, and they were very eager to say like, hey, if the residents think this is working better, why not give it a try? Uh, so that was definitely one of the, um, I think, benefits. Uh, another thing that really kind of appealed to me was, um, you know, in New Orleans, I was actually there during Katrina. That was my freshman semester. So I got to come back uh, after Katrina for my second semester of freshman year. We got to kind of, you know, rebuild this American treasure of a city from the ground up. And it was an amazing experience. So I felt like joining Penn State, you get to kind of build up a program from the ground floor and be a part of something that, you know, could be grown to something really special. So uh, I think those are the pros. The cons, I guess, really are just that, you know, one of the two things I always tell uh, med students to look into um, residencies is one is how happy you'll be there and how happy are the residents and what your fit is like there. But also two is to look at your career um, future prospects and where do these residents match for fellowship? Where are they getting jobs at? You know, what kind of offers are they getting? So in that sense, you know, when you only have two graduating classes ahead of me, the uh, it was tough to kind of see where are these people matching for fellowship? What kind of jobs are they getting? You have a kind of smaller sample size. Um, but I guess in that kind of instance, I put my faith and trust in, at that time, our program um, chair was Dr. Gator, and um, he was our PD as well. And he just kind of um, exuded confidence and kind of promised us that we would be a, you know, a powerhouse program within 10 years. And I was like, all right, this guy knows what he's talking about. Um, Dream big, Dr. Gator. <laughs> <laughs> big shout out to Dr. Gator. Right. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yeah. And like you said, a uh, new challenge, it, it, it was a challenge probably uh, trying to build something, but it's also like seeing it as an opportunity. It's like ripe for the taking and you can just kind of um, make it what you want essentially. So that's great. So yeah. let's get to like the meat of this, right? Let Tell me a little bit about why you chose to pursue a pain medicine fellowship. Yeah, um, and I, I'm going to preface this by saying that I'm fairly indecisive in general, and for me, it takes a long time to make a decision. I was one of those med students who loved pretty much everything in you know med school through rotations, except for general surgery. Um, I knew that wasn't going to be it for me. Um, but with that said, uh, one of the reasons I went to PMNAR is because we have what the most fellowships other than internal medicine. I figured um, I kind of liked what PMNR had to offer with musculoskeletal stuff, kind of sports, neuro, uh, um, kind of the neuro aspect of it. Um, but I figured if I was going to be indecisive, at least I had a lot of options to me going through it, I could figure something out. Um, when I started PMNR, I was pretty, you know, broad. I, I thought I really liked TBI, which I, I still do. I thought I really liked sports and interventional uh, sports and spine. So I was somewhere among those kind of three. And then to me, I thought pain was a good kind of, um, I guess, way to encompass all of those. And the fact that, you know, we all know there's a large psychiatric um, component to pain, kind of blend a little bit with TBI and, it's, you know, similar sort of, some of the same medications are used. Um, I felt that I still got to do some of the sports and interventional stuff because that's what we do, lots of kind of mini procedures. Um, and really, I thought that it gave me um, the best opportunity to pursue a career that eventually would leave me, I guess, financially stable enough that I could pursue other things outside of medicine. Um, so I guess that in a nutshell is why I chose pain. Yeah, that's a actually really interesting point. Not a lot of people who uh, go into pain really tell me that kind of answer where it actually is um, very diverse in your practice. You think it's just like I'm doing epidurals like and I'm seeing back pain in the clinic, but you have the mindset of no, we see a lot of, there's a lot of pain in TBI, there's a lot of pain, you're doing some sports there, and you're right, there's pain in essentially every kind of patient population, and it's unique to that population. So that's a really cool perspective that I didn't really think about. Yeah, and I think for us yeah. as DOs, it kind of appealed to me also because I think pain is a great realm where you can be open to different modalities, such as OMT, such as acupuncture, things that are, you know, considered complementary alternative medicine that, Perhaps um, I think, you know, DOs, we kind of learned from med school that, you know, there's more than, you know, there, there's different ways to approach a problem. So nice. Yeah. 
Yeah. And tell me a little bit more because you're a DO. And so tell me a little bit about where you see uh, doing OMT would fit into a pain practice. I mean, it's kind of goes hand in hand, but how do you see it working out? Yeah, and I guess um, this is one of those issues where it depends where you end up, if you're in the private world or the academic world, um, you know, if you're running your own business, it may or may not be feasible. It really depends how you set up your practice from what I, you know, right now we're at Penn State, one of our attendings um, does practice OMT, she'll set up a longer um, kind of visits for her patients and kind of just fit it in, Um, in the private world, I haven't seen as much of it utilized, but I think it really is a personal choice. If you, you know, depending on, I think some people shy away from it, probably because of reimbursement issues, but, um, you know, I see other people get around it by just doing a straight cash practice or other people like to use it just because it's a different modality and that can help them attract the patient population that may have, you know, find benefit in OMT that they may not be able to obtain that anywhere else. So, um, personally, I would like to use it. I can't say 100% I'm going to use it in the sense that I don't have a job yet. So we'll see if <laughs> and when, uh, where I sign and what kind of model we have and if the time allows for it. Ideally, you know, in, in, uh, in, in my mind, once I have uh, the, I guess, financials and everything stable, I would love to create an all-encompassing kind of pain practice where, yes, OMT is a part of it, whether or not it's fiscally or financially feasible, where I'm okay, perhaps, to take a loss there if it provides a unique um, kind of um, modality for patients. So it seems like there's a lot of barriers to practice it. It's not that people aren't interested or don't feel like it's not going to help, but there's just a lot of barriers that might need to be addressed and... It really depends on where you go. Yeah, it depends where you go and depends what you want to set up. But I think it's a time and reimbursement issue. So as well. Yeah. So you got to do the math and also figure out what do you want your practice to be and what kind of patients do you want. Um, But if it is something you're interested in, it's completely doable. Um, You know, but if you also join a practice, it may be at the discretion of what your uh, group is going to expect of you. That makes sense. Dialing it back to basically the process of applying to a pain fellowship. What did you look for in a program when you were kind of scouting and looking into it? Yeah, um, you know, it's hilarious because it's one of those things you think after you match residency, you're done with the whole, you know, nope. <laughs> yeah, song and dance, but no, it's still <laughs> back still again. Have, back again. Um, so it's like, I think to me, it was kind of like residency again, except that you feel a little bit more confident because you know, if you don't match for residency, you're like, oh my God, what did I do for four years? I'm not going to have a job versus fellowship. It's like, okay, if I don't match worst case scenario, I'm going to be a doctor and I'll be a regular general physiatrist. I'm going to be completely happy. And, you know, I'm going to be taken care of and it's going to be do something fulfilling. So it's a lot less pressure um, from that aspect. Um, So, but yeah, I was looking for a lot of the same things. I think the biggest thing is really, again, fit and where you're going to be happy And number two is kind of uh, career future prospects. Um, Where do their fellows get jobs? Do they get jobs where they want to? Um, What are are they doing? And kind of in that uh, sense for pain, I think it's important to look at what kind of procedures um, are, is this program doing? What do they train their fellows in? Are they more open to experimental sort of things that may be, you know, the way of the future or are they more stuck in their ways, kind of do the bread and butter stuff? You know, so I think, and whatever that, you know, however that aligns with your future goals of practicing, I think that's kind of an important thing uh, to look at. And why did you decide to do pain and not the sports spine? Um, You know, I feel like that's always a a question that a lot of residents try and hash out is which one should I do? And what are the differences that you found? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I think, um, you know, it feels like so long ago, I forgot uh, that that was, but no, um, yeah, so I, I want to do pain because I was leaning toward, I wanted to keep open the option of doing academic medicine. I really like teaching. I really like being in an academic atmosphere. I love med students, residents, being in that kind of collegial atmosphere. Um, I feel like it keeps you up to date on, you know, what's going on in your world. And I feel like there's nothing like staying young when you're surrounded by younger med students, residents, and keeping on your toes. You got to stay hip. You That's what it's for. <laughs> Um, so I, you know, and I think it's also changing even when, when I was applying, 
the landscape is such that I think a lot of uh, academic institutions even now today are okay with you practicing or teaching at their institution so long as you show them hey I have the numbers you know from my sports and spine fellowship and then from what I understand I believe that the sports and spine match and pain match are going to be one combined match in I want to say another year or two so at that point um, I believe it's most likely that probably sports and spine will also have to sit for some kind of board exam and then we'll have you know, the quote unquote paper to make them legit and board certified. But uh, prior to all that happening, I wanted to have that paper, have that board licensing behind my name, give me some kind of, you know, more credibility. Because I think there's a more uh, variability in the interventional sports and spine world. I'm speaking from just, you know, not personal experience, but from what friends have told me and colleagues. Um, but there's a much bigger variability in the quality of training because these aren't under, I guess, the ACG me purview or regulations and I see. some maybe kind of, you know, abusive sports and spine fellowships where they just kind of use you as cheap labor. Others are more about teaching and, you know, so you have to be more careful. Whereas in the pain world, because it's ACG me accredited, there's, you know, certain standards, X amount of didactic hours, X amount of, you It's know, more standardized. Exactly. Kind of, okay. Exactly. So that makes sense. Yeah. And so... So I wanted to keep my options open. Um, you know, I thought that perhaps I may want to go back to California one day. And there, I think at least they were a little bit more strict about academic institutions wanting people to have pain fellowships. Mm -hmm. That may even change in another five years. Who knows? But I wanted to keep all options open. And this felt like the safest route if I could get it. That's a great um, explanation. And yeah, I feel like, yeah, the standardization of having a board ACGME accredited fellowship versus, I mean, sports and spine, a lot of people come out of those fellowships and have great jobs, but it, you have to do a little bit more research in those specific programs is what you're saying. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. All right. And uh, what is the application process like for pain medicine? What, what's a general timeline that a resident can expect? Sure. Um, and I'm going to also have a caveat here. So whoever is applying, please look this up on your own because this may have changed after COVID. But for me, what was it? I guess two years ago now. Uh, I mean, I think you should really know if you're going to go into pain. You should really know by the end of PGY2, if not by the beginning of PGY3 year, which obviously comes up fast, obviously, because you do your intern year in medicine or surgery. Then you do one year of PM&R. And really in that one year of PM&R, by the end of it, you should have some kind of an inkling. So life comes at you fast. Uh, but I say that because you should really have uh, your electives set up in the beginning of third year so that you can kind of audition at places, get your face and name out there. And obviously with COVID, you know, election or elective rotations may be different and difficult to do. Um, but basically I think I knew by the end of PGY2, beginning of PGY3 year, I was going to apply. Um, then, you know, started getting involved towards the end of PGY2, beginning of PGY3 year in different pain conferences, programs, memberships, things like that, just seeing what's going on in the world. But I think um, the applications open up, I want to say at the end of December of PGY3 year, and then you can start applying to places at that time. I probably say uh, January of PGY3 year. Um, already had done an elective rotation, I want to say by you know, January, February. Then interviews started rolling in, I want to say about April, March, April, May, in that time of PGY three year. So the second half of PGY three year. And then you play a long waiting game and, you know, you submit your rank list in September of PGY four year. And then you match October of PGY four year. So it's almost a full year long wow. process. Um, so this is what I mean about the that whole- That sounds like torture, mm -hmm. just an entire <laughs> year dragging it out, but worth it in the end, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. And that's nothing because what I think for pain or for sports, you don't find out till January of PGY four year, right? So wow. So yeah. it's slightly better than that. It can always be worse. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. essentially, um, you know, you need to kind of have that decision uh, by your PGY3 year, maybe early PGY3 year to decide kind of what electives you need to do and, and that process. So a Definitely. little bit earlier than, than other specialties. It is. And, okay. and I want to say sports and spine is even like 
two months ahead of that up until if and when they do combine into one match process. But that's the first decision point you have to make is, are you applying to both? Because at least again, this is from when I was applying two years ago. If you applied to Sports and Spine, then that match date was prior to the pain match and so you would have to figure out if you would accept the sports and spine, you'd have to withdraw from the pain match. And that's a whole nother oh, I see. issue. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, lots of decisions to make, lots of um, branching points, so to speak. Sure. And you mentioned it briefly about the opportunities and how you got involved. What are kind of things that uh, residents can get involved with in order to make their application stand out for, for pain? Yeah. Um, I think, again, I kind of, it's, I think it mirrors the process of residency. Like if you knew you were going to PM&R, what were the things you did to get into a PM&R residency? You know, you do the elective rotations, you try and show up to PM&R conferences, you try and read the PM&R journals and try and stay up to date on what's, you know. Don't leave them on your desk and pile them up. <laughs> <laughs> At least flip through the title page, you know. Exactly. What's, Pick what's the ones the, you like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, see what's, what's relevant in your world that you want to join. Um, because that's going to be interesting to the people in your world. So the more you know about the world you want to join, the more legitimate it makes you seem, the more interested it makes you seem. And then also for your own self, you know if that's really what's interesting to you or not. If you go to a bunch of pain conferences and read a bunch of pain journals and then say, you know what, this is kind of boring or I don't really like this, then, you know, hey, maybe that's a red flag if this isn't for you. <laughs> if you don't like something, I hope you realize it's a red flag. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, but there's you know, no, uh, there's no like for sports, like you have to do more sideline coverage type of thing. It's, uh, do you, do they look at how many, uh, I don't know, injections you've done, how many procedures you've done as a resident or not really? No, I don't know what they looked at on my profile, but I think all of it helps because I think, okay. you know, I did sports coverage. I did all of that. And I think, you know, that just lends itself to, okay, hey, I have a really good understanding of musculoskeletal issues and how to deal with musculoskeletal injuries and, you know, how to get really good with my sports physical exam. And that's something I think um, a lot of the PM&R pain uh, trained uh, physicians have an advantage over anesthesia or neurology colleagues. Um, obviously, they have their own strengths um, and there's pros and cons to all of us. But I think one, one area where we shine in pm and is that our physical exam maneuver, our neuromusculoskeletal exam is very, very strong. Um, and they appreciate that because they want to create a well-rounded program. So yes, if you have something you can offer, you know, that maybe anesthesia or neurology may not be as strong at or as well-versed in, then that's an advantage in your book. And you should really own that and, you know, I looked at it as like, all right, they expect me to be an expert in this. So I want to be an expert in this. And, and you yeah. know how to do EMGs now. So exactly. that's like a huge yeah. advantage um, yeah. since you're always yeah. sending for them and everything, especially yeah. in your field. Tell us about your experience at Penn State for pain. Uh, how has that been? And what are the challenges that you've had this year? This, you know, may rhyme with mm -hmm. Ovid. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's been phenomenal. Um, again, I've been lucky. They um, are a phenomenal program. We have nine different attendings. All of them oh, wow. are so unique. And so they all have their own strengths that, you know, and it's so cool because since we have nine attendings, they've all trained elsewhere. So I feel like I'm being trained by nine different programs where, you know, one or two of them came from Harvard MGH. So it's like, oh, cool. I'm getting indirectly trained by Harvard. And like two of them went to Cleveland Clinic or, you know, like random. So it's kind of interesting. And then working with that many physicians, you take um, the strengths that they bring with them and you see like, hey, I like how they do this particular, you know, physical exam maneuver or this particular injection procedure or this approach. And I'm going to take that or the way that they talk to chronic pain, um, you know, patients. And I'm going to use that in my you know, in my chronic pain spiel or, you know, whatever, whatever you like, you can kind of pick and choose from a variety of very um, highly esteemed and established uh, physicians. Um, I think the, obviously the challenges of COVID have been unique. Um, a lot more telehealth that everyone's doing. Yeah. I don't know about you guys. I'm not the biggest. Definitely. Fan <laughs> it's definitely something different. It has yeah. its place. Uh, yeah, for sure. The biggest fear I had, though, is, you know, obviously being in pain, it's a bunch of elective procedures. 
uh, there's now starting to become, you know, caps on elective procedures during COVID and what wow. kind of, you know, so um, right now we haven't felt the numbers going down, but obviously it's a lot to do in one year fellowship to learn. Um, so it's all about getting procedures and numbers and, you know, dealing with complications and everything you can while you're still under, you know, the wing of an attending and kind of have this little safety net. So I wanted to get as many procedures as I could in this year. And, you know, we keep waiting for their sheet to drop that is it going to start slowing down? I know last year when I talked to the fellows, they said, yeah, when COVID first started in the springtime, they scaled back almost 50%. Uh, wow. And had to fill that time in with extra reading and didactic. So you're still learning and that's great, um, obviously, but you just can't make up for the lack of procedures. So hopefully it doesn't come to that again. We'll see. Everyone's waiting. That's tough. Yeah. That's tough because that's what your fellowship's about, the experience, right, exactly. of, of, of those procedures. And I'm sure it's not unique to your program. I'm sure it's across the board, uh, yeah. across the country, ha having difficulty getting those numbers as a fellow, you know. Uh, the way you respond, like, as a fellow within this time, like, that's a whole learning opportunity in itself. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think, um, you know, I would like to thank every – but like you said, everything's a learning opportunity. So hopefully yeah. this will make us more well-rounded physicians. Exactly. So were you involved in any research or publications as a fellow or a resident relevant to the field? Um, so for PM&R in my program, we had to do one research project. Um, so I basically did a retrospective kind of chart review in patients. It was the quickest to get kind of IRB approval for. Um, and so I was kind of looking... I was able to recruit a med student. She's been super helpful. I recommend all residents try and do that if you can. Uh, so they're so sure. eager. They're so <laughs> eager. Take advantage of that. For sure. Mutually beneficial, you know. She's second author. Um, she got gets gets to have her name out there. But we were basically looking at this is when I was really interested in pain and TBI. So we kind of looked at um, looking at the um, moderate to mild uh, TBI population and looking at the interventions they got, such as occipital nerve blocks or yeah. trigger point injections or um, epidural, cervical epidurals, and just kind of looking at the, you know, how effective were they? Um, and it, did the timing of these interventions matter? Um, so we're kind of in the middle of that. We have some, I guess, promising preliminary data on that. Um, hopefully we'll publish that by the end of this year. I was also really interested in medicinal marijuana for chronic pain. Um, Penn State has a large grant for that, so I'm trying to write um, to be a part of that research team as well. Wow. Uh, I will say, though, there's a lot to do in one year, and I'm not the best multitasker. I don't know if you are, or, um, but it's a lot to do, so try and um, not overwhelm yourself because you got boards to take care of, PM&R boards, paying boards, you got a job to find, interviews, um, you still have a life to live, you still want to, you know, enjoy yourself. Um, if you're moonlighting, that takes up some time. You want to make some extra cat. There's a lot going on, so don't spread yourself too thin. Um, I think that also depends on if you're going private world or academic world. Obviously, academic world, you're probably going to have to do some more research and have that uh, more prominent on your resume. If you're going to the private world, you probably don't need to do that. As and, many. Yeah, and it'll probably be up to you if you want to do that just because you're into that. Um, and obviously, you can always do clinical research, uh, kind of lab bench research was, really, was never really my thing. Um, but I would say that everything is getting more competitive, even for PM&R and for pain. Um, so obviously, uh, the more you do, it can only help you. <laughs> right. Uh, but it's, a, it's a personal decision on whether you like it and whether you think the time commitments um, are worth, worth it. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and what is something that people don't expect that a pain physician or specialist manages? Well, I'll just say from a personal experience, when I was first getting exposed to the field as a, I guess, PGY3 PM&R, and we did our pain rotation, um, I was surprised, you know, we do implants. To me, I was in the OR and it was, uh, you know, one of our attendings was doing an entire implant by himself. And I was like, wow, this is like lightweight surgery. We're allowed to do this. <laughs> like, so going uh, back to when you were like, I don't want to do surgery, exactly. you end up doing more procedures. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So it kind of came, came around. Granted, you know, this is like at most maybe a, hopefully a two hour procedure, even less one hour procedure if things go well and no, no complications. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I was kind of, 
I guess blown away that this could be one of the possibilities you do, but I guess it's also interesting that again, it's an option if you want to do pain, you know, intrathecal uh, pain pump implants or baclofen implants, you can, and you have that option, or you could just do, you know, spinal cord stimulator um, trials if you don't want to do the implant yourself and then refer to a neurosurgeon. But it's nice that you can tailor your practice to what suits you and what interests you. And, um, you know, there's pros and cons to doing your own uh, implants. Um, you know, briefly for someone who's interested in some of the pros of doing it is obviously you become much more marketable if you're a physician who can do an implant and you don't have to refer out to a neurosurgeon or ortho spine right. or whatever the case may be. On the flip side, um, you know, people always, the cliche they say is once you implant someone, you're kind of married to them for life. And so they are the, then your patient for life. You're going to have to do annual checkups. There's pros and cons to that. At least you know, they come in once a, you know, every few months to get a, you know, the baclofen refill and that's generating, you know, patient, you know, follow-ups and stuff like that. However, you're also on call 24 seven. Should anything go wrong? You know, they right. may call you. Obviously baclofen withdrawal is one of the few emergencies that we have in the PM&R and pain world. Um, so, you know, it's a pro, pro and con thing. And also, you know, some physicians I've talked to say they don't like doing it because they have a good relationship with a neurosurgery group and they don't want to steal the neurosurgeon's business. Other people say neurosurgeons aren't really interested in doing this. This is kind of the least impressive thing that they do. And so they'd rather have a pain you know, physician do it. <laughs> it really depends on where you end up, what kind of setting you want and what right. you want to do in your practice. But I just like having the option available if I want to do some, you know, mini surgery, you can do. Yeah, that. I didn't realize you can really tailor it even further in the pain yeah. world. That's that's yeah. really interesting. Going off of that, uh, tell me about what is the presence of you being on inpatient versus outpatient? I know you guys do some uh, inpatient consults. Yeah, yeah, we do um, inpatient chronic uh, consults. We take call. Um, basically, I think from what I understand, the majority of pain programs uh, don't take um, uh, acute pain call. Our program takes both chronic and acute pain. So it's slightly more work for us, but you know, the flip side to that is that we become much more familiar with kind of, you know, bread and butter anesthesia stuff. That's new to me that I didn't, wasn't, you know, right. really introduced to like peripheral nerve catheters and peripheral blocks. And, you know, a lot of people would argue the future of pain is kind of peripheral nerve stimulators. And so like, this is kind of, um, getting me prepared and more well-rounded to be, you know, getting better with ultrasound skills and, you know, how to troubleshoot catheters and right. sorts of things. Um, but as far as the chronic pain world goes, our program, we have four fellows and one acute pain fellow between the five of us, we split calls. So every fifth weekend I'm on call. Um, our chronic pain list isn't really that big. Usually it's, I would say it's less than 10, um, even sometimes less than five. Uh, the acute pain list can get fairly large, um, up anywhere up to 20, 30 patients. So wow. That, yeah, that can get a little bit more uh, involved. Um, but we also do in our program, and I think for, again, per ACGME requirements, you have to have certain sort of inpatient stuff. You have to have, um, I think, neurosurgery rotation, I think addiction, psych rotation. There's various things. Um, you know, we had a couple of days of like headache pain, which with neurology. Um, so there's random things. Wow. Um, you're, for us, if you're PM&R trained, you have to do a little bit of anesthesia, and then the anesthesia trained have to do a little bit of PM&R. So, um, but I would say 90% of the time we're outpatient clinic and just getting procedures. Again, uh, that is where a lot of it comes from because a lot of the other stuff we can read. There's certain things obviously you can't read and you just need the hands-on experience with. Right. Wow. So it's really not what I pictured just being in a fluoroscopy suite doing injections. It's really <laughs> like you do a whole me. lot. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. That's interesting. That's something I didn't uh, realize. So I'm sure a lot of our listeners are glad to hear that. So where are you off to next? What are your ultimate career goals? What are your plans? I know it's coming towards the second half of your fellowship. So yeah. where do you see yourself? Um, hopefully you see myself employed. <laughs> 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 don't we all <laughs> yeah COVID does throw a wrench into that Oof, right some people um you know private practices may not be as willing to hire or if they are they may be looking to give you a lower salary it's just the reality of the situation again being heavily reliant on elective procedures um, a lot of these practices had to shut down temporarily um you know so um, with that said, you know, I'm still interviewing. I would personally love to see myself end up in Texas. I think, uh, 
you know, it's a perfect state for interventionalists. There's no state income tax. The tort reform is phenomenal. <laughs> Out of it all. <laughs> I'm done with winters. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, interviews. Uh, actually, after this call, I have a talk with a potential employer. So hopefully that goes well. Great. Um, but, you know, I see myself paying off the mountains of student debt I have. <laughs> I see myself um still continue learning just trying to get comfortable being attending you know i feel like we've been training forever to finally be in attending and it's pretty scary and exciting that it's months away mm -hmm. um yeah i'm excited to for wow. everything for the responsibility for the actual paychecks <laughs> for, there you go I'm there, looking forward yeah. to seeing where you end up. I'm sure we <laughs> all are. Um, I know you were a big part of the AOC PMNR um, team as a resident. Uh, what was that like? Oh, that was awesome. And yeah. it's, it's pretty, it was great that, uh, you know, I like the DO community that we still kind of stick together and kind of, you know, try and help each other out when we can. And um, it was a great way to just kind of network um, and stay in touch with people I knew from med school, but also meet people at conferences and, you know, grab dinner with people and just, you know, it's a very small field. So you're going to be seeing these people at some point or another at conferences, or maybe if you're looking to find a job or, you know, word of mouth. And so, um, you know, networking is key. I think making friends in your field, uh, you know, being collegial with your, with your, um, with your cohort, or with your colleagues is, is invaluable and um, you learn a lot. So um, I appreciate it. And it gave me a lot. You have some more added responsibilities. Um, obviously, it didn't hurt to put it on the resume too. Right. So it's kind of a win-win situation. That's great. I love that. Um, yeah. So, ending on a fun note, tell us about what you do outside of medicine, outside of fellowship. Favorite hobbies, stuff you like to do. Yeah. Um, so I love uh, love to travel. Once COVID ends, you know, I can't wait to get back. Well, I'm out. sure you're hurting right now. <laughs> I can't wait. I'm sure like a lot of people uh, itching to, to get back out, see the world. Um, so traveling, basketball, I love basketball, and even the gym is shut down now. Can't do that. So, you know, I can't be too upset. I'm still he healthy and COVID hasn't affected me like that. And we still have a job. And uh, so that's awesome. But yeah, no gym and no travel has been tough. Um, I would say that's kind of where I, I keep most of my uh, free time. Yeah. Yeah. What are you, what's your favorite place that you've traveled to? Oh, man. <sighs> Uh, hard question, but yeah, that's tough. Let's see. Um, if I I would have to say, I would say the Euro trip post match was phenomenal, just because you know I was with three of my best med school friends, and we just did three week kind of seven different countries, bunch of different cities. Um, that was phenomenal. Did a intern trip solo two weeks to Thailand. That was really kind of you know eat pray love sort of phenomenal. Oh my god. <laughs> Did you find uh, yourself? <laughs> I, I would like to think I found myself. So <laughs> great. Myself. So great. <laughs> um, the obligatory Euro trip. Yeah. There yeah. we go. And I would say that my favorite city, I would have to say Rio de Janeiro. Those people have a love of life like I've never seen outside of maybe anywhere. So yeah, I would say those three will, will come to mind first. I, I wish you luck on your future travel endeavors once this, thank you, thank once this all normalizes. Yeah. Hopefully I'll get to visit you in New York soon. I know, I know. Come to us. I know you're from here, so we'll see you. I'll see you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So any last minute advice that you have for residents? Um, I, if I had to summarize this whole talk again, um, do what you love. So get involved early. See if it's something you truly love. Um, and can see yourself doing for the rest of your life. Um, and after that, um, be aggressive, be passionate about it. That'll show through interviews and show through with the people you talk to. Um, I think it's easier than you'd imagine to tell if someone's really not that interested or in it for the wrong reasons or kind of faking it. But if someone's really interested and passionate and enthusiastic, I think that really shines and shows through. Um, and hang in there. Um, you know, you're, you picked an awesome field. Worst case scenario, you're a general physiatrist. And I think that's a, a great position to be in too. <laughs> it's a win-win. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. It was so great to hear your journey and just see your journey personally from med student to now almost being a senior. It's been just great. How can our listeners follow you or get in touch with you if you have any, if they have any questions? I mean, if they have any questions, feel free to share with them. Um, my Penn State email I'm completely fine answering questions, mentoring, whatever I can do to help, you know, paying it forward. Um, yeah.
I, that's always open. And if you're a resident pursuing fellowships or med student wanting to learn more about various opportunities in PM&R in general, please subscribe to the AOC PM&R podcast so you can get notified for additional episodes. Thanks, guys. Catch you next time. Thanks, Chanel. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.